here. Yeah, and we'll get back to that next time. That's actually a useful tool with a silly name. But anyway, first we're going to do this. All right. And all we're going to do today is finish up windows. I was going to start the Mac section, but it's not very big, and the windows is big enough to use up the time. Um, so, here's the last three topics of windows to cover. It did take three whole lectures to cover it, and uh, that's imp it's the most important thing. <coughs> most of the investigations are done on windows. So, we'll talk about these other artifacts, memory forensics, and alternative resistance mechanisms. An interactive session is a term used by Windows. You can have an interactive login, which means you log in in such a way that you then see a desktop with a start button with your own name in the corner, and you have your own My Documents folder and all that jazz. That's an interactive login. Now, there are non-interactive logins, like when you connect to a shared folder, and it will only let you in if you have a certain username and password. So it does send a hash of some sort. It could be a Kerberos hash or an NTLM hash over the wire, which verifies your identity, and it lets you in the folder, but it does not go through the whole process of creating a profile and storing that hash locally. It, it has less, leaves less forensic artifacts on the system than an interactive login. Um, remote desktop does give you your own desktop and, pro, and folders and such, so it counts as a login and creates all those, and screen sharing also does, um, at least according to this, because you have to log in. Um, I'm, I think the third one there deserves a little more explanation. I know TeamViewer lets you share the session where someone is already logged in. So if I log in as Sam and someone connects remotely, they are also Sam, so they're not going to have a separate login profile. They did have to log in, but it's not the same. Anyway, uh, then there's link files. Link files are Microsoft shortcuts, and um, the, when Microsoft automatically creates a link for every open file, and it puts it in a recent files folder, and this is how it determines your recent files. Um, and it's a separate list for each user profile, so this is a handy thing that will show what was opened and who opened it and when. So they're here, they're in C documents and settings, username, recent. And uh, the ones in Microsoft Office are stored in the special subfolder for application data, uh, Microsoft Office recent. And other programs may store them elsewhere. And these are used to, for the recent legal open files. So you know the full file path. So it's going to store not only the name of the file, but the folder and device it was on. So if you're opening files from a share or a USB stick or something, it'll show you that. Um, even the serial number for the volume, which is nice because that will help you determine what USB sticks you have to seize to get the evidence, and other information, including, of course, who did it and when they did it. Um, you can make a timeline out of these things, and then you have a, the person opened this file, they went to this folder, they opened this file, and this is usually what you do in a case like data theft. They opened the secure folder, they copied the stuff, they put it on a USB stick. You know just when this happened. Um, all right, then there's these jump lists. If you right-click these icons at the bottom, you get this list of recently opened things. Those are pinned things. These are here, but some, if you're using a lot, you'll have recently opened things there too, and that's called a jump list. And every uh, application has their own list of them. Um, they can be stored in different places, but most of them are in places like this in app data roaming, um, and. They are not stored in any reasonable way. They're stored in some foolish proprietary format, which is the way Microsoft used to do everything. And around 2008, they reformed and started making things XML because it is much better to have plain text storage formats that can be searched and that are registered in standard places, but they haven't really converted all the way to doing that. So a lot of the operating system still uses the old philosophy of each development team just making up some random binary format for every task. And that's what this is. So you have to download some reverse engineering tools. Uh, this is, by the way, the the interesting and somewhat shady business of reverse engineering. Um, Microsoft doesn't publish information about these things, and you have to just figure them out and write a tool like these that will undo it, and that is technically illegal. It is a violation of Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and yet it's how people do everything. This is why Bill Gates was on record for a long time saying Linux is just organized software piracy, as far as he's concerned, because it's the only way anyone writes a driver for anything in Linux, is to take the Windows driver and reverse engineer it and translate it to Linux, which is technically illegal. Anyway, um, but people, by tradition, get away with a lot of this, and unless it's actually a song or something, people usually don't prosecute or something, commercial product. Anyway, um, here's the recycle bin. Uh, here's where files go if they're deleted. If you delete them from the desktop, they go here. If you delete them from the command prompt, they do not go here, which is mighty rude. And if you delete them from any other device, like a floppy disk or a USB stick, they do not go here. Now, that one I understand, because it would be kind of strange to actually take your hard drive, which might be nearly full, and actually add more data to it because you're throwing something away. 
But anyway, that's the game. Um, things are put in the recycle bin. When you throw them away, they're not really removed from the disc at all. And the idea is you have a chance to get them back. You'd have to be a pretty lame criminal to actually hide the evidence by putting it in the recycle bin and not even empty the recycle bin, but it could happen. And here's where you go to find it. Uh, again, it's some goofy binary format, so you have to download some kind of tool. This is Reefy UD32, Reefy UD2 that does it. This uh, takes the contents of the recycle bin and puts it in XML, so you can open it in a browser. And as you see, you get the time it was deleted. And um, you also get the path it came from, which includes the name of the user if it was on somebody's desktop or in their documents folder. So that's useful stuff. You know who was using it and who threw it away and when that happened. So I've heard from forensic investigators that um, if you investigate at a company, like you're investigating somebody for doing something bad on the company network, they often get tipped off by a friendly coworker that doesn't believe they're the perp. So you're coming in at like two o'clock to examine their machine and they are warned. So they're in there at 1.30 madly deleting everything. And they say, this is the best thing because now you know right where to go to find it. Whatever was deleted in that time period because they usually don't know enough to actually delete anything, they're just putting a red flag on it. All right, and then there's memory forensics, which you started this class by using a few tools on. Uh, the main tool we used here was uh, Memorize for detailed memory forensics. There is another tool that was strongly pushed by some of the red teams at CCDC called Recall, and I spent several days writing up projects in Recall, and as far as I can tell, Recall is completely worthless. Um, it doesn't do anything better than Memorize, even though it's supposed to. It may eventually replace it, but at the moment it just seems to be in a sort of non-functional beta version where it does nothing I could find that was much value. Anyway, but there are all kinds of cool stuff is in RAM. You have a list of all the running processes, network connections, drivers, your credentials are in there. One thing I used to, was showing you all the conventions a few years ago, you can totally steal the currently logged in user's password out of RAM with a variety of techniques, which is mighty rude but it's stored in reversible encryption and the key is also there so you can get your plain text password of the currently logged in user from RAM. Um, and you've got the registry and uh, the event logs in there, clear text data and kernel properties and a list of all console commands. Memorize can do awesome things. It can find all the console commands that have been typed in. It can find all the notepad files, everything in there that have been opened recently. Just You can get tons of stuff out of RAM. Um, so, what happens when you want to program is actually pretty interesting. And the more I learn about it, the more interesting it gets. Um, there are the, there's physical memory, which is RAM chips, which is the best place to put information because it's fast, but it gets full. And so if you begin running out of memory, blocks of memory are taken out of the RAM and put in the page file on the disk, and, and the program doesn't know this has happened. It will just know that when I reach for some memory, it gets a whole lot longer to get it. And um, that lives in this page file. Then there's crash dumps. When your machine crashes with the blue screen of death error, it automatically saves some dump information so that someone could analyze that to find out why it crashed. However, your average user has no ability to analyze that and no interest in it, so the default setting here is to save nothing except the kernel memory dump, which is very small, because it can store a complete memory dump, which would be if you have four gigs of RAM, it'll be a four gig file every time you crash, but the only person that would do that would be someone that's developing something that's crashing like a kernel driver, and on their test machine, there's or someone who has actually paid for Microsoft support. And that's what, you can do this at a company, and this is what, you know, Microsoft has a knowledge base full of thousands of articles that are fantastically detailed, explaining exactly why some problem occurred and often having some special thing you can download to fix that problem, and that's because of their customers that have paid for support. If your company pays for Microsoft support, you can turn on the crash dump and you can email this crash dump to Microsoft and they will totally figure out exactly why this happened and write a little tool to fix it and send it to you. And they, then they archive the article and that's the Microsoft knowledge base. Um, but anyway, people who haven't paid for all that have no reason to use this. So in practice, this is probably going to be too small to do you any good because the kernel memory is very unlikely to contain anything of forensic value because it only includes stuff put there by Microsoft kernel processes, not something the user is writing a document about. And unless you're debugging Windows, you're probably not trying to find out exactly what's wrong inside Windows. Yeah? Is the crash dump in a somewhat organized fashion? It is. It is. I think it's just a, a image of RAM straight through, not even compressed or anything. And I think um, Memorize can read it. Put zero all the way down in a certain map. Situation. Yes. But yeah. Same thing? No, no, you guys finish your conversation. I, I think he's done. done yet. Yeah. You're done? Oh, um, so you said that it was uncommon. Is it uncommon in a corporate environment? That surprises me. I can't say. I think, I think if they pay for support, it would be more common. But I would think it would probably be only on the developer side or something. 
Because typically, if you complain in a corporate environment, it goes to your help desk, and your help desk goes, I reproduce the problem. I wouldn't, if I was there, I wouldn't want random users sending stuff straight to Microsoft. I would want to reproduce it on my development machine and then send it up from there. But, but I'm not sure. It'd be up to their policies, how they set it up. I mean, yeah. uh, I used to work at Chase the Manhattan Bank, yeah. the Microsoft uh, partner. Yeah. And uh, we had a telephone number that rang in Redmond. Yeah. Hello. Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, how are you? Yeah. And did uh, they yeah, save this? Sure, yeah. Did they have every machine saving the full dumps? And actually, uh, hold on for Jason. Okay, hold on for Jason. And Jason yeah. would come up on the line and, okay, sure. Uh, hold on. Uh, let me do something here. And then, uh, okay, fine. And I'll get the file and call it back in a half an hour. And Yeah. yeah it's so not a bad they, idea. They would give us uh, extra software for whatever reason, like they want to shower us with stuff. And yeah. we had a fantastic tech support relationship because Another the thing, bank would pay, yeah. pay five hundred million dollars per year to buy stuff. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and another thing, by the way, is that this is not a common thing at all. It used to be, back in the days of like Windows 98 and Windows 2000 and XP, you'd see the blue screen of death a lot. In a modern Windows machine, you don't see it that often. So, unless you're using flaky drivers. Now you have the recovery yeah. thing coming yeah, out. Yeah. It's, like, they, it's basically the same thing, but it's watered down to like, yeah, that's yeah. how the user freak out. Anyway, so it's possible that you might find a crash dump sitting around that would give you something, but it's not enormously likely. Um, unless it's a machine where they're developing something that's actually crashing with blue screens. Um, so these where it's stored local app data, crash dumps. Um, all right. Then there's hibernation files. These are on almost every machine. The default of Windows machines is when you, you can make, they'll go to sleep, and you can also send them into hibernation where the power consumption goes to zero. Everything is removed from RAM, stored on a, in this file, and when you restart it, it will recover it all. So you can have like an open Word document that's written and not saved yet, and it'll be saved in the hybrid file. And when you recover the machine, when you repower up the machine, when you click a button or something, it'll wake up and put that back in RAM. And that is just a copy of everything in RAM. It's very nice. It's compressed, but volatility can open it up. And then that's very nice. That's just the kind of file you're creating with a memory acquisition tool like you did in the early projects where you run some tool and create a file of RAM. The hibernation process just does that. So it's pretty cute. Um, like a virtual machine it has virtual memory. In fact, hibernating machine, I would think, would probably be one of the simplest ways to acquire memory. I don't know why, for instance, people don't talk about this. Just hibernate the machine to get the RAM. It'd be a live acquisition just like running one of those tools. Anyway, um, so volatility can, yeah. Well, once what happens in that file once you trigger out hibernation and it goes back to RAM? Does that file automatically get this? Yeah, that's an issue. I'm not quite sure. I think it just sits there, though. I think if you reboot the machine, the old hybrid file is just sitting there. It still contains the old data until you hibernate again. But I would want to test that to be sure. But that's sure what it looks like. Because if you look at in root of C, you'll just find this hybrid file sitting there. Like if you're a 4 gigs of RAM, it's a 4 gig file just sitting there and doesn't seem to change until you hibernate again. Uh, yeah. One other quick question is, I mean, four gigs is pretty, pretty decent size to yeah. create in the time it takes to put in hibernation. So, yeah. is it always taking images of the RAM the entire time? So no. Be multiple images. In that no, time? just when you hibernate, and when you try to shut it down, you'll click like start and an arrow, and one of those yeah. options will be hibernate. Yeah. And there's sleep. Sleep is much faster because sleep actually leaves it in RAM and puts some power through the RAM chip. So it'll actually technically drain your battery, but it's such a low power consumption, you're probably okay for about a month. Hibernation, your power goes really to zero. You can take out the battery and it won't be gone. But it takes longer to hibernate and longer to recover from hibernation. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so once you've got an image of memory, you can find every process in there. You find its process ID, you find the relationship between processes, the path, the command line, number of threads. You know, you get almost the same kind of information that you get from task manager. And here's uh, Python. Uh, Volatility finding, which you did in the project, you just get it pretty much the same thing you'd get from task manager. You know exactly when these things started and so on. And notice it even has a column to tell you if it's a WoW 64 process, which would be a 32-bit app running on a 64-bit machine. So it's pretty nice. Um, it also tells you how many threads and how many handles there are in each process, about which we have more coming later. So I got a few eye clickers about that. Come grab one if you need one. All right, let's see what I can do about fitting things on the screen better. All right. Okay. 
So which one appears when you right-click a taskbar icon? Quit at 30. All right, they call that a jump list. This was a big feature, I think, came out with Vista. Makes every one of those buttons like your own start button. And it's again another list of recently used files, which is very handy for forensics. All right, which one can you only get with a live acquisition? That is processes. When you shut down the machine, the processes are lost, they're running processes. The rest of these things are all on the disk in one form or another. All right. Where do you get the entire contents of RAM? Hibernation file. What's right. the page file again? What's what? Page the page file is just random chunks of memory that wouldn't fit in the physical RAM that were moved over. So it's a small fraction of certain user processes um, and other processes. It doesn't have all of RAM at all. It's the swap file. And so it's, it's, it's temporary storage for something that should have been in RAM, but RAM is full. And so little pages of four kilobytes at a time are swapped back and forth. Those are the pages. So it's got but it's not everything in RAM, and that's what the hybrid file is. All right. And which one contains only the kernel memory by default? It's therefore not terribly interesting because it doesn't have any user processes, and that's usually where the forensic interesting stuff is. And that's the crash dump. By default, it dumps only the kernel memory, which is really small and fast. All right. All right. So let's carry on to this one. So handles, I mentioned we're going to get to. If you are writing a program and you open, say, a file to do input or output, you say file handle equals f open of file name. Now you have a name like f pointing to that file. That's a handle, unless you point to something. So are your variables, or your connections to input-output streams, and all these devices. So every program has a bunch of these handles, which are um, paths that lead somewhere else on the machine. Um, so that's one. The number of handles that we open is something you can see about a process. And mutexes are special handles which serve to transmit information between processes. So two processes will have a handle with the same name that points to the same place. So a process could send a signal to another process. These are like Android intents, and they are, um, they call them mutants or mutexes because they're somehow special handles that are shared by two processes. And the point of them is one process can check to see if somebody else is using this, so I better not use it until you're done. But malware uses it a lot to avoid infecting the same box again. So if you get infected with Zeus, Zeus will make a mutant. And if you get infected, if Zeus is run again on your machine, the first thing you'll do is check, and if that mutant exists, it won't try to infect it again, so you don't get multiple infections piling up on the machine, you know, become making it obvious, using up the RAM and fouling up the process. Yeah? So some of the antiviruses use that, where they kind of collect the, the mutexes from known things and kind of, you know, kind of put them It is. There. They should. They should use it to detect uh, active infections, but most antiviruses don't look for things like that. They try to spot things before it gets infected, well, like the executable itself. Not that they're looking for it, but they, you know, kind of like a vaccine, you put the mutexes in there, and that way the antivirus oh. will kind of say, oh, I'm already running here. That's not a bad idea. I'm not aware of any antivirus that does that, but that is a pretty clever trick, like a vaccine. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of anyone doing that. 
But maybe I read an article about it years ago, but that's not a bad idea. I don't know how well it would work, but it might be fun. Anyway, um, so that's the game here. And here's Zeus, for example. Here's Zeus runs, and Zeus creates this thing called Avira 2108, which sounds like a brand of antivirus to me. But anyway, that's what they called the, the when you're infected with Zeus, you have that, one of the old versions of Zeus. Zeus is now open source malware. The, it used to be sold under, in the underground economy. You'd pay a few thousand bucks, you'd get a licensed version, and then you could use it for as part of crimeware kits that you use to control people. And eventually it got old, and the developer just open sourced it and gave it to the world. So it's commonly studied by uh, malware analysts because it's very easy to get copies of it and play with it. Anyway, um, here's so I opened Notepad and opened it in uh, Process Explorer. Process Explorer is the Microsoft um, Sys Internals tool that lets you see all this jazz. So Notepad down here, you can see all the handles it has. It handles for this and that and this and that, various numbers. Um, all the things it's connected to in the file system. Hexadecimal What's that? Hexadecimal numbers. Yeah, there's hexadecimal numbers. The handles actually have values. They're sort of like inter IRQ numbers. And um, so every, this, this is something I found very interesting. The more I do with this in various classes here, the more I'm getting straight in my head. The uh, malware analysis is where this really comes out. If you run Windows processes, they all think they start at the address 400,000 in hexadecimal, all of them. They are running in virtual address space. Like a virtual machine, they have their own section of RAM, but it's mapped to a virtual RAM, so they all think they have a certain memory field, and there's no available memory address that points to some other process's memory. So Notepad has its process, its memory, and Word has its processes. They would have separate RAM assigned to them, and they both have remapped them to different numbers, so they both think they're loaded in the same RAM virtually. That's the game here. And uh, so it swaps data in and out of physical memory. The operating system, unbeknownst to the Notepad that's running, it might the operating system might decide that some of this RAM, I need it for something else, so I'm going to throw it in the page file and put something else there. And when Notepad tries to read, you know, 400,000 and 400, 500, it's not here, it's on the hard drive. So it goes to the hard drive and gets it. The operating system hands it up. It's just a thousand times slower, but Notepad doesn't even know. It's using the hard drive instead of RAM. It's just wandering through its virtual address space. So that's pretty cute. And it keeps track of all this with the virtual address descriptor tree in the kernel. You can see the memory map. If you download MMAP or VMAP, which is another system kernels tool, it's kind of cool. It, it, remember, Microsoft uses a very complex memory model, much more complex than Linux processes, with many heaps. And uh, so you got a heap here, and I think there's some other I've scrolled off the screen. But you have a lot of, so here's virtual addresses of various kinds going down here. These are the ones that are randomized with address space layout randomization, and some of the others aren't which is how you can often overtake machines where that defense will not protect you because Microsoft doesn't really randomize the location of every part of every program. So if you find a vulnerability in a part that's not randomized, then that defense doesn't save you. Anyway, it's cute. Now you don't have to know the details of this necessarily, but it's helpful to know the tools that you would find it if you really want to analyze something. And here's the dills that Notepad loads, which is probably more directly useful to us. Every program loses libraries. In Linux, you typically combine it all in one executable. And so two programs use the same library. You have two separate copies of that library in RAM. Windows tries to be more efficient. So it will have one copy of that library loaded. And once it's loaded, like there's very common ones like advanced api.dil and, and kernel32.dil that are used by essentially every program. The first one that launches will put a copy of kernel32.dil in there. And every other program will just connect to the existing copy and they will all share it. So you can see all the dills that are loaded. And this is the number one way you launch malware is you launch an extra fake dill or you place one of these dills. It's the most common way to launch malware. So seeing what dills are loaded by a process is a big step towards understanding if something is malicious. So you can check to see if you have valid digital signatures on those DIL files. You can check their hash value and see if they are known good or known bad. And you can look for uh, malware that loads a DIL surreptitiously or does something nasty. There's um, and more about that coming up later. The other things you'll see in memory, you'll see all the network connections like Netstat, um, all the live connections they're uploading or downloading or web pages people are viewing, updates that are coming down, and remote control connections if someone is remote controlling your machine through some kind of backdoor. Um, you see all the drivers, the console commands, other strings, just any text file that has been stored in memory, and credentials floating around in memory. If you want to analyze the page file, it really is a mess. It does not have any specified files with names or owners or anything. It just has random chunks of data that it decided to move one page at a time out of memory. Um, 
The only thing you can really do is search for strings in there. You might find a fragment of an email or a fragment of a web page or something, but you're not going to know who put it there or when it was put there. So you have to be very careful. One thing about this, which I know um, got one of the uh, one of the cases one of my te Frenchy teachers told me about, his students got a case and they analyzed this case and they again, most of these cases are about teachers accused of watching porn in the classroom, which apparently is a big problem. And so, uh, like, kinder, like grade school teachers. And so the student got a case, they analyzed this guy's machine, they found all these links to pornographic websites, they said he was guilty, and he said in the first place they took an unlicensed version of a case. An unlicensed version of a case, it will show you nine lines of data, and the tenth line will say, don't use this in court, this is not a licensed version. So they took Photoshop and Photoshopped that out, and pasted it back together so it looked like the right screen which is highly unprofessional and illegal. It is not a good thing for the forensic examiner to be using illegal software. This is just not a good thing to go to court with. And then they found all this evidence, and he looked, the evidence was in the registry. It was the antivirus definitions of the antivirus product, listing all the websites that were blocked. It's not an evidence that someone went to that website. It's quite the opposite. Some kind of security product was blocking access to those websites. So the same thing happens here. You can find all kinds of suspicious things in the page file, which are not because the malware is running on the machine, it's because your antivirus has those definitions in some kind of database that ends up in the page file. So it's a thing you know. You can turn off, you can make the page file clear every time you shut it down, but it just wastes battery life and time, and most people don't care. But it is an option that can be turned on if you want. Anyway, so in memory, the most common attacks you have are process injection and hooking. Both of these are probably the two most popular ways you get malware to run. Process injection is very nice. You inject uh, extra code into a running process, like Explorer that's drawing the desktop. Inject extra code, now it will run as long as that user is logged in. It's only when you log out that Explorer terminates. Um, so it's an in-memory attack that nothing changes on the disk, and the injected process does not leave any evidence of how it got there. Just it's running, there's a dill here running, and it doesn't have any record of what time that was loaded or what caused it to load. Somehow it was provoked to load to that dill. There are API calls to do this. You can just call an API that says load a dill. It's very commonly done. So that'll force it to load a malicious dill. Um, that's one way to do it. There's another way to do it, which is called hollowing out a process, where you load a process and in a suspended state, and then you erase the code in the process and replace the code and then run it again. So it, it thinks it loaded from this disk file, but the actual image in memory no longer matches the disk file. Um, all right, that's process replacement. Redline detects these techniques, and if it does, you saw marks them injected. It was not terribly effective at doing this, but it would notice some of the nasty things, some of these nasty properties. Um, you might, now one thing that's a pretty big clue is you have a memory section that has execute, read, and write permissions. This is no longer normal. There's a protection feature called write or execute, um, <laughs> they work here. Anyway, um, the, but there's a general security uh, procedure called write or execute. Memory should either be executable or writable and not both. But these have both permissions, which is not normal. Um, and like say, if the process doesn't match the disk file, that means somebody loaded it and then somehow altered it without altering the disk file. All right, so the injecting process, here's another way to go about it. The inject, you probably, if the malware is going to survive a reboot, then every time you reboot, it has to redo that injection. So you might find the injecting process's auto start extensibility point, which is all the usual stuff, the run keys in the registry, download or hijacking, all those things we talked about before. So that would be one way to find it, even if you don't feel like digging through the dills and processes and trying to find which one of those is not kosher. Hooking is another alternative. And you know, Windows has so many ways to make programs run extra code. It'll make you sick, but they're all there for reasons. And um, so this one here, for example, suppose you have antivirus. You have a computer, you're running some process like Microsoft Word, then you open a file. Your, your process wants to touch a file, load the file, and put it in memory. The antivirus wants to grab it. Wait, before you touch that file, I have to scan it. So it has to somehow jump in front of every access to the disk and say, wait, before you access the disk, I have to do something first. And that's a useful feature, but that, that's a hook. And it has, there's just API calls to add a hook to something, so every time this process happens, it'll stop and go do this other thing first, which is obviously uh, candy for malware authors. Um, 
and they can intercept, modify, and view events. So say, every time you try to reach the registry, let me grab it and check that. And this is also what things do like the redirector, right? Your 32-bit program wants to write a registry key, and it has a hook. Wait, before you look at the registry, let me see if I should lie to you. Oh, you're 32 bits. I better lie to you and tell you lies about the registry so you don't mess with the real registry, and on you go. So it's just asking for rootkits. This is what rootkits do. Rootkits make your program lie. You're infected with a rootkit. It will now make a folder someplace and have all kinds of malware in the folder, and it will not let you see that folder. When Windows Explorer tries to draw a window letting you see your files, it will hook it and not let you see those files. When Task Manager tries to see the process, it will hook it and not let you see those processes. When you run Netstat, it will not let you see those network connections because it hooked those processes. And every time before it goes to the real function, it goes to a little code put in the malware that says, wait, if it's one of the ones I'm hiding, don't let them see it, but if it's anything normal, let them see it. So all the programs will continue to run, and just mysteriously, some portion of your computer will now be doing something you don't know about that you don't like. And that's the game here. The old-fashioned keyloggers would do this with hooks. They would do set Windows hook X to create a malicious dill, which will be called every time a keyboard event occurs, or they use this one that gets a sync key state and then just pull the keyboard. This tells you whether the keys are up or down, if you pull it many, several times a second, this other one has sort of an interrupt created. Every time you press a key, it runs this thing. Oh, somebody pressed a key. And you can hook those and do whatever you'd normally do about the key, but before that, put it in my log. All right, you can also manipulate a process's import address table. The import address table means the process is going to use functions from somewhere else. Remember, Notepad had all these other things like add API. So probably so it can do something like open up a save box if you click File Save. So um, it's going to have imports, which are which functions it wants to use in the library, and you can modify the addresses in the import table. And I've got a picture of that coming up here. Um, so what happens here is this one here is API hooks, and it's showing a system infected with Zeus. So here's a function imported from WinInet. Now, this is why you use these libraries. If you want to do anything with the internet, like you have some update feature that goes to the internet or something like that, or you can load pages from the, the web, you use this WinInet.dil typically. It has a lot of these libraries. So this function is going to call HTTP send request, and the A tells you uh, how many bits the reply code is. I think A is 16 bits. So this is um, going to make an HTTP request to a server, and when it calls that function, it should be going to here. I think this is the real code here at 771C. But it has been overwritten by this A address. So when it tries to do that, it goes down here instead. Oh, no, it's a, I got it backwards. It's this one. This is the injection because this is where they put a jump. OK, this is the real deal. All right. And they put one jump instruction here. Notice this is crazy. It jumps, and then there's code here it can never get to because this is what the bad guy overwrote it. It now jumps down here and does something evil then replaces the instruction you overwrote and jumps up here. So this is the malware, and this is the hook connecting it in, so that now it does an extra thing not intended before it does that process, and that's how rootkits and such work. It's very simple, very hard to prevent. There are other things, like a descriptor table and a system service dispatch table that were used in Windows XP and earlier versions on modern versions, of Windows, they have something called kernel patch protection that is good to stop them. And I'm not sure about this one, but I'm pretty sure this one came from the Blue Cat Conference, which is one of Microsoft's smarter ideas. Microsoft, until about eight years ago, had an official policy that people should just not do any research in security at all. They should not find vulnerabilities. They should not tell us. They should just shut up and everything will be fine. If nobody can find this stuff, we're fine, which is a pretty foolish position because there is, in fact, an active criminal empire of very smart people finding these things, writing viruses, and Microsoft just wants to pretend that's not happening. So after they spent about 10 years trying to shut people up with every technique available, they finally gave up and accepted it. And when I went to TorCon, they bought us all beer, and Microsoft officially entered the hacking community and said, OK, we understand they're ethical hackers, and we're going to cooperate with you guys. And they had the Blue, Co Blue Hat Conference, where they invite you to come to Microsoft. Certain people have to be invited. I have never been invited. It's not my field. But anyway, they, they, what they will do is they will pay you a bug bounty. They will pay you $100,000 if you find a major problem with Windows, and they will pay you another $100,000 if you write a good solution. And a lot of the cool features that made Windows 8 and Windows 10 more secure came from this, and this is the kind of thing. So somebody found a way to hook these things, and then they developed kernel patch protection to stop it. And I know they invented some cool ways to stop heap overflows and so on. Um, and one of the ones that I heard that is in, I think, Windows 10 now, which makes a whole lot of sense, is that if you have a dill like this, 
it knows that it should only enter it at this point. And it has a table that is hard for the malicious person to alter. It says it's only supposed to open at these 10 points, these 10 functions. So if this thing tries to jump to some other address and run this code, it won't accept it. It'll recognize that as suspicious and crash. So it's, it's a kind of intelligence defense that raises the bar. Anyway, um, so you can acquire these things with uh, FTK imager or dump it or memorize and analyze it with memorizer volatility. Um, yeah, I got a few more eye clickers. Then we ought to take a break. So, all right, what's a kernel data structure that shows you how memory is used by each process? All right, and that's the VAD. I forget what it stands for. The VAD is the kernel data structure. Um, well, let's, let's see. Here, VAD. It's in here somewhere. The virtual address descriptor. That's what it is. That's what keeps track of what lies it's telling you where it has relocated RAM for each process, where the chunks of memory are. Uh, very simple thing, simpler than a virtual machine, but amounting to a very simple version of the same thing. All right. Um, which item will include malware signatures even when you have no malware? is uh, the page file. It has chunks of junk that should have been in memory, and if it happens to be memory that was used by the antivirus engine, it will have malware signatures in it. All right. Can you say that again? What's that? What, why is it page file? Because uh, it has random memory from any process, and if it gets memory from the antivirus process, it will have antivirus signatures as its database of what it's looking for. All right. And uh, which technique is always malicious on that list? As far as I know, there may be, now there are clowns like Sony that use malicious processes for legitimate purposes, but they usually come to regret it. In the spirit of the CISSP, I would dare say there is one best answer, even if they are all stupid. So, um, and the, the process injection is something that I think there's no legitimate use for, where you trick a process, like hollow it out and put in some other code. If any, that is a malware trick. The rest of these are standard things you do for perfectly good reasons. It's hard to think of a legitimate reason to do that, although somebody might do it. And then they would probably get all mad when antivirus starts blocking them, saying your process looks suspicious. This tends to happen. This is part of why there's so many false positives in antivirus, because people copy some technique from malware, and they look malicious when they run. Uh, like Sony copied rootkits, which turned out to be a terrible problem and got them in a world of trouble but they were trying to solve a very difficult problem. How do you mark a machine so the user cannot remove the mark or change the mark, and I can tell if the song is playing on the machine that paid for it or some other machine. And Microsoft does not offer any API calls to make an indelible permanent mark on your machine, so they had to use dirty tricks to do that, and it turned out to cause more harm than they expected. Anyway, um, all right, which one is used by malware to prevent reinfection? All right, and that's mutants, also called mutexes. Um, it's not. That's not how you do it. Hooking is how you make code run before a process. You grab a, a process 
API call and grab it and change the message. And that's not used to detect infection. That's how an active thing like a rootkit would lie to you. But a mutex is a mark you put in there, like a handle showing Zeus is already running. So when the installer tries to install another copy of Zeus, it just sees that that's there and it knows not to bother installing another copy. All right, so let's uh, take a break. We'll pick up at five after seven. Let me stop this recording. This is chapter 12.